I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. Today, we're going to talk about spectrum policy as it relates to defense, and I'm really excited to have my good friend and colleague, Tom Carrico, here on the show. Tom is the head of our missile threat program here at CSIS and a senior scholar. Tom, welcome. Great to be back, Andrew. All right. So not a lot of people understand spectrum. I am one of those people that doesn't understand spectrum. So before we get into its implications for defense and for national security, can you tell us a little bit about spectrum and how you see it? Yeah. Well, look, uh, uh, I was also a liberal arts major. (laughs) Uh, And coming at this from a policy perspective, uh, suffice to say, the electromagnetic spectrum includes, you know, everything from visible light to radio waves and all these different kinds of communication that we do. uh, So much of the 5G and the cell towers and all this kind of stuff all across a broad, uh, a broad spectrum uh, that is everything from UHF to different uh, bands that have letters S band, C band, X band uh, and so on. Uh, and it, it corresponds to kind of the, the wavelength and, and this sort of this These sort of thing. These are the radio waves across the world. Radio waves are, are, are definitely uh, an important part of that. And so from a national security perspective, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of commercial interest. And a ton of the spectrum has been auctioned off over the past uh, many years uh, for commercial use. In fact, the majority of it has been auctioned off. Uh, and uh, there's a handful of things that are kind of left for DOD to have uh, exclusive use so that we don't uh, jam or interfere with some really important national security uh, and military, especially radar applications. And it's kind of the biggest debate going on on Capitol Hill uh, that very few people know about. Yeah. And it's fascinating. And there's a handful of folks. It's come up in, I think, every DOD nomination hearing that's been handled this spring because there's a handful of folks that are really, really spun up because it turns out it's a really important issue. And so uh, the, the issue is really, especially within what's called the low three, the low three gigahertz from uh, 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz is where we have a lot of military uh, air and missile defense radars that operate. And uh, there's some proposals from, let's just say, the telecom community that want to take that for commercial use as well. And the, the question is, well, where do the radars go? What, what, as it turns out, there's not just a whole lot of place left in the spectrum for them to go. Is it possible for them to both operate, to sh- kind of share that part of the spectrum? Uh, and so I think the spectrum's finite. It, it, is a, it is a scarce national resource. And, and what would telecoms do with it? More internet, more 5G, 6G, 7G? Probably more, yeah, more of that, uh, greater bandwidth and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's not... Uh, demonstrably clear to me that it's ne- absolutely necessary right now, even from a commercial uh, standpoint. But nevertheless, you kind of understand the desire to to grow and that sort of stuff. But I would I would I would pose this uh, scenario, uh, Andrew, that you remember back in 2018 when there was that Hawaii text message that was sent that says there's a North Korean ICBM coming yes. in. Well, that was a that was a, a test that was inadvertently sent. It scared everybody to the bejesus. What would happen if that text message went out in the case of a real missile threat scenario from North Korea. And people got that text message just a couple microseconds faster, but it had the adverse effect of jamming the radars that would track that missile and be able to do something about it. That's kind of what's at issue here. I see. So so the, the national security implications of this are truly at the center of the debate versus commercial interest, which commercial wants to move forward. But you're saying this is really a defense priority. It, it, it absolutely is. And the interesting thing is this is, this is a, a contentious issue, but it's not a partisan issue. Uh, this is, you see folks on both sides of the aisle who are saying, no, 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 for national security, we have to have our military radars be able to operate uh, unimpeded. So tell me about the debate on the Hill. Is it part of the big, beautiful bill? Is it part of what the Republicans are hoping to be reconciliation? Yeah. So that's the intent. And in fact, uh, just yesterday, uh, one of the most vocal and thoughtful uh, leaders on the national security side of the debate, uh, Senator Browns, said that there appeared to be approaching a compromise uh, between uh, the national security types and the kind of commerce uh, committee types, led especially by Senator Cruz. And so that's that's good. And the, the better news yet is that the compromise appears to protect that area that I keep going back to, that low three 
uh, part of the spectrum. Now, nothing is done until it's done. Sure. There are tons of big differences between the House and the Senate on all kinds of issues, macro, macro spending and, and, and tax kind of, uh, kind of issues. So we, it's still a bill. It's not a law. But uh, hopefully that compromise will hold. I would say, unfortunately, there's other parts of military spectrum. I think there's some expand, other parts that are important for intelligence and for space. Uh, you've heard, you know, you know uh, Andrew, there's not many things that the Biden Pentagon and the Trump Pentagon <laughs> agrees on. Right. This is one of them. Interesting. You saw the Biden folks say this will cost hundreds of billions of dollars to fix these radars. And you see the Trump Pentagon saying the same thing. OK, so. Where is the debate right now on the Hill, and how do you see this issue being resolved? So so the specific bill provision is to kind of reauthorize the FCC, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, to uh, auction off spectrum, but to give them legislative guidance about what they can, how much they can uh, auction off, and what they can't. And so the reported uh, uh, news is that uh, the 3.1 to 3.45 uh, part of the spectrum that is so important for radars is going to be protected. This is the kind of the tentative deal that seems to have been struck and that they will have, I think, up to like 600 uh, megahertz or something like that that will be auctioned off. And so in some ways, the telecom side get additional bandwidth, and that's a good thing, but most importantly protects at least most, not perfect, but protects the most critical areas of the of the uh, spectrum for military use. Tell me about spectrum in terms of missile defense and missile actually using missiles offensively. Yeah, well, that's that, that's that's important because, you know, I think it's, it's possible to approach this as just a quantitative matter, that all spectrum is the same and, you know, more is better than less. Uh, and, and why can't we all just operate in, in the same uh, spectrums uh, simultaneously? And it's the more you understand about the functions, the discrete functions of missile defense radars, the more you appreciate why auctioning off these sensitive uh, areas is just a bad idea. And so a given missile defense radar, first of all, has to surveil. It has to kind of be on all the time. And why is that? Because China is not going to tell us when the missiles are coming. Sure. No one is. <laughs> right. And so you can't you can't kind of ask Okay, telecoms, turn off the cell towers so we can turn on our radars. It doesn't right. work that way. Right. Uh, so that's the surveillance mode. Then you got to identify what is this thing that you're getting a radar energy reflection back. So classification and identification. And that, that requires you to compare the signature, the look, as it were, against a threat library that we've built up over decades of what missile threats look like within the S-band, for instance. And so then you have to track, develop a track. You got to keep bouncing radar off it constantly to get that track, develop that track, so you know, okay, where is it going? What's it threatening? And then you got to launch a missile, and you got to, that radar then has to send an uplink to that missile to kind of say, okay, steer over in this direction. So the radar is a very, very critical piece of this, and it's all these discrete functions. And the more you kind of appreciate the complexity of those functions, the more that you realize you don't want a cell tower beaming energy on that radar and blinding it and jamming it. Tom, what about other technologies besides radar that work with it? Yeah, well, uh, that's that's a good question. In fact, uh, and I'm a big proponent of space-based uh, sensors for tracking hypersonic missiles, for instance. Uh, but it turns out that the hypersonic missiles are a lot hotter than, uh, say, a low-flying cruise missile or cold ballistic reentry vehicle in the, in the vacuum of space. For those things, for uh, so much of the missile threat spectrum, it's just really hard to substitute for radio frequency, for radar emanating energy, bouncing it off, and then getting it back. And so those those other technologies, they're, they're, they're good. They have an absolute critical role, uh, but you just can't, uh, you can't substitute for radar. And look, there's other kinds of uh, artificial intelligence and, and things like that. But for the time being, the idea of being able to share within the same bandwidth, it's just not there. And so I think the, the, the right thing to do is to protect the military uh, pieces of it, continue to study the problem, and see if in the future maybe we can sell off these last bits of <laughs> military spectrum to, to have dual use. But for right now, it is just not we're not, we're not there. And it's just too, uh, I would say, dangerous to, uh, to do that. Tom, how is the S-band different from other parts of the spectrum? Yeah, that's, that's, that's also a good question. It's been called uh, a Goldilocks zone within kind of the radar world. And the reason it's a, it's a it turns out to be a really good compromise between being able to surveil uh, a broad area, being able to penetrate weather. So wavelength corresponds to ability, ability to penetrate, say, rain and have that uh, radar energy go out, hit the target, come back, and still have something meaningful and useful. 
and uh, so that's why it's there's other L band, C band, X band. They all have uh, utility, but for the again the discrete functions uh, of that we talked about uh, in terms of uh, tracking, classification, all that kind of stuff, it just turns out it's especially useful uh, bandwidth. And so that's why we have you know all of our Aegis ships at sea are S band. Uh, the Army has uh, S band radars down at the including at the southern border, uh, for instance. We've got the LRDR up in uh, Alaska that would track that North Korean uh, ballistic missile in the S band. And so that's there's lots of these things out there. And this and that's kind of uh, the reason why. So, Tom, just to bring it back to the American people, how does the, the U.S. balance national security, commercial innovation and public access in spectrum allocation? Yeah. Well, I think that it has been balanced uh, in a pretty good way in the sense that there's a, a lot of. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi and uh, cell phone, all this kind of stuff that has been auctioned off over the years. I think we got to be careful about going too far on that, uh, looking for additional uh, means to perhaps share. But I think the kind of legislative compromise that appears to be emerging that first and foremost protects the most sensitive national security uh, bans, that's actually, I think, a pretty good path forward. Tom, what, what role does spectrum policy play in our competition with China's 5G strategy? You know, that's really good. Now, it's interesting because a lot of the international telecom bodies that have been kind of pressuring the FCC to sell off, let's just say the S-band, uh, it turns out they have a lot of a uh, China influence on them, incidentally. And there's been some discussion, well, other countries have uh, commercial use of the S-band. Uh, I would point out that China itself does not allow your high-power outdoor S-band usage. They've got their air and missile defense radars, too, and they're not going to let us uh, do this sort of, or they're not going to let their own people, excuse me, interfere with their air defenses. Uh, there are a handful of countries that do have uh, commercial S-band usage, and you know what? They're going, that's going to interfere. Let's just say a, a U.S. Aegis ship is in the vicinity, and we're defending one of our, our allies that, uh, that so allows that. It, it can create interference. And so there's, there's basic zero-sum costs at this time until we come up with some secret sauce that fixes the basic physics of radar energy propagation and return. We're, that's just where we are. Tom, this is fascinating. I think we all know a little bit more now about this technology and why it's so important to our national security. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Andrew. This was fun. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 